Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Today I shall be ranking the Eastern Roman Emperors from Constantine the First to Constantine the Eleventh, going dynasty by dynasty. Joining me today is Mark, who shall be going with me through this journey through over 90 of Constantinople's emperors. Now, without further ado, let us begin. We shall be carrying on our tier list with the Heraclean emperors. And we have a fine selection of men to take up that spot. We have Heraclius, Constantine the Third, not to be confused with Constantine the Third, Heraclonos, Constance the Second, Constantine the Fourth, and Justinian the Second. To start this all off, I understand, Mark, that you are a fan of Heraclius. That is yeah. to say, he is your favorite emperor. And yeah. to acknowledge this, I think it's only right that you should go first in talking about Heraclius. Where would you put him on this list? I, I mean, it pains me because he is my favorite emperor, but I, I have to put him in the great category rather than exceptional. Um, the reason why he's in great and not lower down, I think is self-evident. He became emperor at this time of crisis. Obviously, when well, he seized the throne, I suppose is perhaps a better way of putting it, at this time of crisis. And, you know, with basically one army left at his disposal, he managed to roll back the Sasanian tide um, and taking quite gutsy moves throughout the campaign, such as not returning with his whole army to Constantinople when it was under siege. By the Athars. And then his three victories in three days in the mountains north of Mesopotamia, I think shows his military brilliance. Mm. Any defeat would have, you know, signaled perhaps the end of the Byzantine Empire. So, you know, his, his achievements in militarily, in winning, it was a Byzantine victory. It, it, oh, yeah, uh, I mean, hands down, it was. And the, the recovery of Jerusalem, um, his negotiations to reclaim the true cross, which is it's always been something that I would always wanted to see his procession, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem with the, with the true cross. But he can't be an exceptional emperor. He can't be because he managed to live to see all of his gains. Not to mention, of course, before I get on to his losses to the Arabs, not to mention, of course, his attempts to mend religious schism only created more schisms uh, with his monoenergism and then monophiletism uh, experiments, uh, shall we say. His terrible succession plan. So he planned to have both his son Constantine the Third and his son Heraclonus become joint emperors, and it just didn't work out. And after he died, he basically had a whole year where the Eastern Roman Empire was paralysed in the face of determined attack. And I, I would blame this instability strongly as one of the major reasons why Egypt was lost. Mm. Unfortunately, Heraclius' greatest triumph was ruined by some bloke in Arabia that decided it would be a good idea to start a new religion. Yes, after 20 years of war, you know, the Byzantines were exhausted. Is there much he could have done? No. But nevertheless, he presides over the start of the worst disaster to befall Rome since the fall of Rome. I mean, by this point, he is, you know, quite decrepit. He can't actually lead his army on campaign. I think it's clear his counterattack against the Persians took a lot out of him. Nevertheless, Yarmouk's horrible defeat for the Byzantines. From what I can gather, because it's not a very clear battle because most of the sources dry up after the end of the Persian War. And then you've got very fragmented or much later sources that fill in the gaps. And it just sounds like the Romans just got completely outmaneuvered by the Arabs and then destroyed. I think it was a case of them underestimating their opponents because it clearly wasn't just another Arab raid in the borderlands. Yeah. Um, it, was, it, was, it was something uh, far worse. Uh, from the Roman perspective. So the the latter part of his reign, in my view, undoes the good, the greatness even, of his first decade, first well, two, two decades. decades. Yep, two decades uh, as emperor. Although um, I would say, just in Heraclius' defence, 
if it wasn't for him, he would not have been able to preside over the disasters oh, yeah. of the last third of his reign. Because if he lost the Persian War, whatever would have been left of the Eastern Roman Empire would be, at best, a rump state, and at worst, not exist at all. Yes, I say, he. Uh, in my view, he's a great emperor. He can't be exceptional, though, because... I mean, no slight against him. His achievement shouldn't be discounted. But what sets Justinian and um, Constantine, who are my current only two entries into the exceptional category, apart from Heraclius, is that they didn't lose everything they gained within their lifespan. But for his achievements in saving the empire yeah. and for his brilliant military organisational skills... I would also add his logistical skills in that with the empire was completely bankrupt, the, it was also striven with religious disorder and he managed to pull together fragmented and remaining resources of the empire in one last push managed to keep paying his armies and the civil service by minting silver coins instead of gold ones and it's one of the only instances that the emperor called upon the church to help him out financially which i think only happened four or five times in the whole history of the empire there's the military aspect, but also all of the logistics and statecraft involved to keep the empire together. I don't think he had a proper revolt against him either. No, no, I, I, I can't think of one. The only one um, I can think of is right at the end of his reign, his bastard son, John Athalaric, tried to have him murdered, but he was caught and dealt with. Where would you put him? I would uh, agree with you. I'd put him in great as well. I think you've pretty much covered all the main points. <laughs> An interesting, if not controversial, app. And then we move on to his son, Constantine III, who got a bit of short shrift from nature because he came to the throne while he was dying, basically. He had caught tuberculosis. I think he was in his mid to late 20s. By all accounts, he could have been a good emperor, but... He was only on the throne for about a hundred or so days, then he died. Uh, for those days, he manages to consolidate his power with his supporters against supporters of his stepmother Martina and Heraclonos. Again, he has to try and pick up the mess Heraclius was in when he died, with the Arabs knocking on their doorstep and invading Egypt, which seems to have been the priority of his reign. Constantine the Third could have been a good emperor mm. if he had lived longer which makes it a bit difficult to put yeah him in. i i'm inclined to put him in unrankable uh, um, why would you say that there's nothing really which you can use to judge either way so to speak if if, if one puts him in as a bad emperor, well i mean did he really do anything bad in four months whilst no. on his deathbed no he managed to rustle up million solidy to pay all of the troops. Or as I say, he managed to push out opponents and organise troops to defend Egypt as well as send or begin to organise the defences in Anatolia. I think mediocre. No. Um, there is action. There's, yeah. there's, you see him beginning to pull the pieces of the, of the Empire together to defend against this new threat. He isn't able to pull much of it into fruition because he dies. A bit like Jovian in a way, in that he does things which you would probably be expected from any good Emperor, but doesn't live long enough to do anything exceptional. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Or anything that detracts from him either. Yes, I'll, I'll put him in mediocre also. Um... And then we come to Heraclonus, which is mm. almost a misnomer because Heraclonus didn't reign. His mother, Martina, reigned for him, basically. So when we judge Heraclonus, we're really judging Martina's regency for him. She basically she gets rid of all of Constantine's supporters in the capital and brings her supporters back. She tries to pay the army again accessional donatives, but the money has already been spent a few months earlier under Constantine III, and so she's not really able to galvanize military support for her. She sends the army that Constantine III had organized to Egypt 
it arrives and doesn't have too much of an opportunity to change things around. The initiative has already been lost, in a way. And then the following year, Alexandria has uh, surrendered to the Arabs. So things are happening to try and save Egypt, but almost too late by this point. This uh, year of four emperors doesn't help. However, there a rumor spreads that Martina actually poisoned Constantine III, which, is, which isn't true. Constantine the third supporter Valentine decides to make sure that Constantine's sons Constance the second and his brother Theodosius are protected from Martina as a coup Martina and Heraklonos are disfigured and then exiled and then they're never heard from again you can see competency there an action but also Martina was just so unpopular with the general public that she just couldn't survive and her situation was in a bit of a fix as well. It takes a level of incompetency to lose a throne in a matter of months. Um, yeah. Incompetent, maybe? I think either incompetent or mediocre. I don't think Raklonus and Martina were bad or awful, but I don't think they were decent either. I suspect I hit the nail on the head with uh, what is it? And now we come to Constance the Second, whom I find to be a very interesting emperor. So in the seventh century, you have a huge transition from the late Roman period into the Byzantine period proper, and this is when the late antiquity ends and the early Middle Ages begin. Uh, this is the time of the Dark Ages as well. So it's a whole lot of change going on. And Constance II is kind of at the forefront of that change, because it's up to him to try and adapt the Empire into its new circumstances. It's under his watch that, although he's never able to actually defeat the Arabs, he is able to outlast them and uh, hold the three core territories of the Empire together, uh, that being Anatolia and Armenia, uh, Africa and also the Mediterranean islands like Sicily and Sardinia and he manages to consolidate um, these territories. He establishes a professional navy, the Carabissianoi. The formulation of the strategia begin in his reign, although the e exact dates of and like actions of the Opsikion was made here and the Phryxikion was made here is a bit more difficult because this kind of information just doesn't exist. They just kind of pop up. But most of these changes seem to take place during Constance's reign and continue on into Constantine and Justinian. So in many respects, I think Constantine is a good emperor and sets up a lot that will come afterwards. But also he is not without his failings. He nearly loses Armenia. He's only able to take it back because of the first Islamic civil war, where you have the Umayyads versus the Ali. There's rebellions everywhere. You have a rebellion in Africa, which he is able to bring under control. And there's another in Italy by Olympias over the whole monothelitism controversy. And then there's two rebellions at the end of his reign, one which he gets lucky with in that the usurper dies after he falls from his horse. And then the second one is less fortunate because that's where Constance is murdered and then Mazizius is proclaimed emperor, who's the Count of Opsikion. Against the Arabs, he loses the Battle of the Masts, which basically ends the Roman domination of the seas. He tries to retake Egypt in 645, uh, but that fails. Not so much his fault, but the commander in charge lost the initiative. But he is able to keep hold of his territories. And also, he campaigns into uh, the Balkans for the first time in, well, since Heraclius. To, he goes on a kind of tour from Constantinople to Corinth or Athens. Uh, Athens, I think. And then, and as he does so, he is capturing and resettling Slavs into Anatolia. So he's trying to repopulate Anatolia. Then he goes west into Italy, which is the first time an emperor has actually gone to Italy, or since the fall of the West, which he has 
some small success against the Lombards, but it isn't enough to actually knock them out and consolidate control of southern Italy. He, he arrests, he arrests uh, the Pope. Pope Martin, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's their own fault for not following the rules. So, <laughs> Constans, so Constans is a monothelite. He follows his grandfather's religious policy of monothelitism. But he realizes he can't solve it, so he issues an edict that basically bans discussion of it. And then what does the Pope do? He decides to talk about it like a complete git. And he got exactly what he deserved. Especially Maximus, a monk from Africa. Stirring up trouble for nothing. And then he spends the last few years of his reign in Sicily, which in some sources is characterized as, ah, Constance is running away. But it's far better to see it as, and probably far more accurate, he has managed to consolidate what's going on in the East, and then he moves westward, where he's got two of his substantial provinces left, uh, the islands in Africa, and needs to reassert control over there and continue reorganizing things. He introduces the Apothecai system, uh, which is a system of military warehouses which is designed to supply the army. He campaigns into Armenia in 661 and reasserts Roman control over there. Another detractor for Constans is that he murders his brother Theodosius in 662 after this campaign into Armenia. It's possible that Theodosius was plotting against him, but we don't know why. And then I think until we do know why it is a mark against him. He certainly has a lot of successes, but he ha also has many failures as well. In my opinion, I think his successes far outweigh his detractions. It's like the Battle of the Masts, he loses. Fortunately, nothing immediately is able to come from that. The Arabs continue to raid up into the Sea of Marmara, but as soon as the civil war happens, he, they withdraw. It no should... territory is lost, although control over the sea is. I mean, it should also be, I think, noted that the Battle of the Masts, he did bloody the Arab fleet quite significantly. Yeah, there's the Arab sources for the period which are about as trustworthy as the Byzantine ones are, that they're all written centuries later, or at the very least decades. I think they say there's something like 20,000 men die. That may be true, but it may also be like a total of men dying. And also, the Arabs send an army into Anatolia during that offensive, and that gets defeated as well. The important thing for Constance II is that the line is steadied. He manages to survive the onslaught and also sets the empire up for the next few years, which is vital. I'm inclined to put him as a good emperor. Same, actually. I, I've already got he's him placed a, there. Yeah, he's not a great emperor. He stands out. I think it'd be a disservice to his achievements to put him any lower. And then we come to his son, Constantine IV, who also, I would also say is a good emperor in that, well, one, he saves Constantinople. So he's able to defeat the Arab fleet that sieges Constantinople in the 670s, which is a major threat because at that point, if Constantinople fell, which is the heart of the empire, the empire is, even with Constance II's reforms, the focal point of the empire is Constantinople. That's where the central bureaucracy is. That's where the emperor is most of the time. That's the, the heart of the empire. And if the Arabs were able to take it, a good case could be made that the empire would fall apart. But uh, they don't. And Constantine is able to hold the line and defeat the Arabs uh, using Greek fire, and do it decisively. Their fleet is completely destroyed, and also a land army, which is sent into Anatolia, also defeated as well. As I'm mixing that up with the second seat of Constantinople in the next century. There's a lot we don't know about the reign of Constantine IV. Most of it is just kind of big event, big event, big event, then he died, despite the fact he reigned for 17 years. Then in 680, he is the man that solves the monophylite controversy. He calls a ecumenical council, 
monophilitism and monoenergism are declared heresies and puts that whole controversy to bed. Unfortunately, at the Bulgars, when they arrive in the 680, Constantine is initially successful in that he manages to contain the Bulgar threat as they penetrate into the Danube, but when he departs, he falls quite ill. He leaves the campaign and affects morale quite drastically. And as the Romans are pulling back from the campaign, the Bulgars ambush them at the Battle of Ongol, the army's destroyed. It is a defeat, but fortunately not too much happens. The only thing is the Bulgars now become a power in the Balkans when there wasn't really one before. Because after the Avar siege of Constantinople in 626, the Avar Carcanate becomes weak and is no longer a threat to the Byzantines. So the Bulgar entry basically replaces that threat. But fortunately, because it's still quite early days, the Bulgars haven't evolved into the major threat in the Balkans they eventually become. Constantine the Fourth is a good emperor. Yes, yeah. yes, I, I, I do agree. He died before he was wasn't able to have a longer reign. I, I think, I think he was in his mid thirties when he died. Yes, um, he he and Constans the Second. He, he builds on Constans the Second's work in holding and then uh, you know stabilizing the frontier uh, yeah. with the Alps, ensuring that their expansion, at least at the moment, was checked. And which is an achievement in itself, and so and yes, I, I have put him in good also. Perhaps a, just a feather in Constantine's cap. This smooth succession when his son Justinian becomes emperor. There's no rebellions, no one's murdered. Although the, there is the case where in Constantine the Fourth's reign where he has both of his brothers. I can't remember if they're mutilated or not, but they, they plot against him to try and seize more power for themselves, and he catches them. That's all I have to say for Constantine. Mm. We have now the last Arachian Emperor. <laughs> Why don't you go first, Mark? I am very fond, perhaps misguided, but I am nevertheless very fond of Justinian II. He has a resilience which, I mean, his first reign seems to be a period of good, competent rule. Or at least, you know, relatively good competent ball. I would agree. That period from 685, when Constantine dies, to 692, his reign just continues up in an upward curve. It's after 692 that things start to go horribly mm. wrong for him. But, I mean, his, his recapture of a lot of the um, Balkan uh, and Greek territory, which was lost to the uh, Slavs, yeah. Is, is, is a feather in his cap, to buy your expression, Constantine Fourth. It was needed. I don't think he conquers territory. I think he does what Constans did, which was go on a big campaign and with all the prisoners settle them in Anatolia. Uh, I think it's 100,000 Slavs get resettled into Anatolia and uh, he drafts 30,000 of them into the army. But yes, his, his uh, you know, stabilization of the situation in the Balkans at least momentarily, is, 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 is a good achievement. But, uh, as always, there is a but. I mean, obviously, he, he did suffer, I think it's at Sebastopolis? The Battle of Sebastopolis, yeah. Yes, um, that defeat. And, of course, his deposition in 695. Uh, yeah, 695. Okay. Sebastopolis happened in 692. And before that, he has the council in Trullo, which is his new imperial hall, which he's built, which manages to sour relations with the Pope again. That period then, until his deposition, things just continue to go badly. It's like the raids against Anatolia begin again after Sebastopolis, when peace had been re-established along the frontier. The trouble is, with his first reign, is that although it's quite successful, He's running the empire as if it hadn't just survived nearly being completely destroyed. That is to say, he's doing building projects, he's, he's becoming riskier with the campaign, he's being a bit reckless with his diplomacy. It's like in Cyprus, where an agreement had been established that the 
two empires, the Caliphate and the Eastern Roman Empire, would share the resources and governorship of Cyprus. He decides to move a large number of Cypriots into a new capital called Justiniopolis, which uh, annoys the Caliphate, and mm. is actually the reason why, one of the reasons why the Caliphate declares war, is one of the reasons for the war in 692. It's a kind of sequence of events. You have his resettlement of the Cypriots, then the Caliphate starts minting their own dinars instead of Solidi, and they've all got messages from the Quran starting to go into circulation as well, which annoys Justinian. And then he decides to declare war, then Sebastopolis happens, then things go very badly. Then after that, he blames the defeat on Leontius, who he imprisons, and he also has these Slavs who are a big factor in the reason why Sebastopolis was a defeat. He has a lot of them executed. I don't think it's quite the mass executions of people that no. are in Theophanes. You bear in mind he was writing over a hundred years later based on another source, which we don't have anymore. But um, I don't doubt that he sought retribution. Also, his ministers have been imposing very high taxes and were rather too efficient in their enforcement of Justinian's will, which manages to alienate the population of Constantinople. Justinian tries to get himself out of it by releasing Leontius, which was the worst idea, mm -hmm. and uh, Leontius deposes Justinian. But that is not the end of the story. Mark, do you want to give us a little highlight? Obviously, in exile, he gathered support. He uh, negotiated a lot with um, various barbarian tribes, so um, I believe the Khazars and the Bulgars especially. He yeah. negotiates with to get their support and so come 705 he comes to constantinople and you have this rather ludicrous scene at least it is in my mind how i imagine it of him basically trying to get the people of the city to open the gates to him in the they wouldn't do it but then some of his aides and and companions uh, suck into the city they climb through the aqueduct of valens which had been destroyed in uh, 626 and then they basically seize, seize the city from the inside out. And he managed to capture Leontius, I believe, and Tiberius, and beheaded them in the Hippodrome. People do say perhaps this, he is far too brutal in his second reign. There is an element here of not making the same mistake Leontius made in keeping Yefo alive so they can continue to plot. So, you know, to remove the threat of them doing it, pulling off exactly what he had just pulled off. Obviously, there was obviously, his, you know, the spice of being deposed in the first place. I mean, I, I do think, you know, perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps I'm callous, but I, I do really think anyone in his position would have done anything differently in terms of being brutal in that uh, situation. Well, as far um, as I am aware, the main purge that Justinian does is right at the beginning of his second reign, when he has just taken over the throne, and he just gets rid of everyone, just like Kirov accidentally being pushed down the stairs. But anyway, <laughs> he he gets rid of everyone that wronged him in uh, 695. He has the Patriarch blinded or something like mm. that, who was a git because he had supported Leontius. He had. Heraclius, uh, who was the the previous emperor's brother, executed, and he had lots of uh, officials and officers executed as well. I do understand why this happened. Unfortunately, this happens right when the Arabs are in the middle of their offensive again, and yes. it leaves the empire, especially the military, quite weak in the face of uh, determined attack. The Arabs are able to capture Cilicia where they hadn't been able to before. And this is partially because when they went for the chief city of that region, Justinian basically had to send a army of raw recruits and junior officers. As one can expect, they were defeated. Most of the bloodthirsty nature of Justinian's second reign mainly happens at the beginning. Mm, yes. And then the, the sources of skip six years he was in power to 7-11 and then talk about 
why he was deposed. Yes. And actually, if you think about it, the reason why he's deposed is not because of some palace coup or like a major rebellion in a Strategus, but it's because of a bunch of disgruntled soldiers in the Crimea who managed mm. to get very lucky and Justinian's very unlucky. Of the three expeditions he sends to quell this unrest in the Crimea, which is basically an outpost of the empire, it's not even a proper province. The first one is successful, the second one is defeated, and the third one is also defeated, but then they join the rebels and they proclaim a guy called Philippicus Emperor. Mm. And um, it's only because of that that they're able to sail straight to Constantinople. Um, just, well, Philippicus just was not exactly a hero of his hour mm. because um, the first thing he does when he gets to Constantinople is he has Justinian's wife and his uh, baby boy executed. So, mm. um, it's Justinian's rather caught out, isn't he? he yeah. Isn't in Constantinople at the time. He's not caught out because of he was doing a bad thing. He marched his army, which presumably had been formed a bit by then, to Sino in a kind of defense and depth situation to counter enemy attack into Anatolia. In the sources, he literally sees Philippicus's fleet sailing to Constantinople, and then he rushes back there, and Philippicus is able to bribe his army into defecting to him. I think it is telling, however, or at least a little bit, that when Justinian is executed, his Count of Obsikion is also executed with him. He decides mm. to uh, stick by him when he didn't have to. So Justinian was able to garner loyalty in his second mm. reign. And also, he's able to come to a reconciliation with the Pope Constantine over the Council of Trudeau. He actually compromises with the Pope, where last time he tried to have him arrested. A bit like what happened to Constance II. Mm. I get the impression that Justinian as a ruler, at least for me, was better in his second reign. Partially because he is older mm. when he starts his second reign. He's 36 when he becomes emperor in 705. And then he reigns for another uh, six years. So he's 42 when he's executed. So I think that helps. He's a bit more mature, a bit wiser, a bit more cautious and open, less hot-headed. Unfortunately, by the time he gets to his second reign, the Empire is in a completely different situation than it was at the beginning of his first reign, which a significant part of the reason for that is him. I think controversial is probably the best way to sum up him. Where would you put him now? Perhaps controversially, perhaps not. Good is why I put him. I put him as a good emperor. You know, revolts and losing the throne, not once, uh, but twice. Uh, second one, obviously, resulting in his death, notwithstanding. Yeah. He is clearly a competent emperor. His resilience in the... His, I, I like to use the term he is a mad lad, if you forgive forgive the colloquialism, in, in regaining the throne, yeah. um, I think is it's remarkable. It's a remarkable story. Um, it could make a smashing film. Yes. Uh, hopefully someone <laughs> somewhere will do it with a good budget one day. Yeah. And he is a good emperor. Um, and, you know, his second reign, aside from his purge, there isn't really much there. And as is, you know, it's often the case that if there isn't much being talked about an emperor and they're not reigning for more than like a month or so, that yeah. usually means that it's because they are ruling competently. Yeah. So, perhaps because I'm enamoured with the whole romance of Hale, um, I am putting him as a good emperor. I won't give him quite as much credence as you do, but I do think he is a decent emperor. I would definitely say that his first deposition was largely his fault, and definitely a defect as a ruler. Most of his reign, in both of his reigns, is fairly competent. I mean, the situation had changed in his second reign, so, which again, as I say, was largely his fault. But again, it's kind of, I don't, I wouldn't say that his deposition in his second reign is necessarily his fault. 
but more circumstances got out of his control. He got bad luck in not being able to get to Constantinople first. If he had done, he may well have been able to destroy Philippicus and continued as emperor. And with his son Tiberius, he would certainly have secured the succession. That is the Heraclean dynasty, which is certainly a very interesting dynasty. I don't think there's, except for maybe Constantine and Heraclonus, a single emperor among them that doesn't have an interesting quality to their reign. But, unfortunately for Justinian II, his deposition, and then death, causes the 20 years of anarchy. And we'll be talking about those emperors another time. I hope you all enjoyed our discussion. Thank you, Mark, for what you had to say. Oh, th thank you for having me once again. And this has been Eastern Roman History.